It seems to me that uh, the year 2020 and then uh, the first half of 2021 have comprised um, a, a global propaganda spectacle uh, of unprecedented scale and sophistication. I, for one, believe that we were subjected to a series of carefully planned psychological operations over the course of 2020 and just beyond. I think it started with the rollout of the virus. This particular instance of fear-mongering is the most persuasive, the most um, compelling, the most devastating kind of fear-mongering uh, you know, that's ever really been used in the history of propaganda, and that's really saying something. We've seen the, 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 the fear propaganda uh, move from the Hun to communism to terrorism, but now it makes the crucial move to the thing itself, the thing uh, with which previous uh, uh, enemies have been compared. The evocation of the virus is all around us, you know? was enough to turn the wits of millions of highly educated people. It's a very easy matter to get people to do what you want, you know, uh, just convince them they're under attack and that anyone who argues with that claim uh, is putting them at risk. So today we're talking to Professor Mark Crispin Miller about the assault on free thought and free speech. He's been a professor of many subjects for many years. He's been teaching a course at NYU on propaganda. So Professor Miller, uh, you're an old friend of ours. Talk, talk to us about how you got interested in this field. Yeah, it's an interesting story. Um, before 2005, I was... Um, I was regarded as, a, as an edgy but acceptable media critic uh, and was therefore allowed to write op-eds for the Times. I wrote four or five. I was often on NPR uh, talking about things like pop culture and so on. In 2005, uh, my career took an unexpected turn when Basic Books published uh, Fooled Again, which was my analysis of how the 2004 election had been stolen. It was a very thoroughly documented study of that theft. It had been uh, you know, vetted carefully by the publisher's lawyers. And I and the publisher were very um, optimistic about the book's chances of uh, kickstarting a much needed national discussion of um, the US voting system, which is the worst in the developed world. And I therefore hoped that this book would make some kind of a difference, that people would address the issue. Well, it didn't happen, uh, much to my surprise and the publisher's surprise. The book was pretty much blacked out by the corporate media. Uh, a total of two newspaper reviews in the whole country. One was a hatchet job. And um, it was impossible to get an interview on NPR to talk about it. Uh, the Times, the Washington Post, none of them would review it. But the strangest thing about the book's reception was that while the corporate media blacked the book out, the left press attacked it as conspiracy theory and called me a conspiracy theorist. I mean, these are outlets that I'd written for myself <laughs> And uh, I knew some of the people who wrote these pieces. So when I got over the shock of this, I, I asked myself, wh when exactly did this become a thing? When did conspiracy theory become a thing? Um, it, it can't always have been uh, a phrase that springs to everybody's lips the way it does now. So I, I researched its history, and it was very simple. I, I just went to the archives of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Time Magazine, and did a search on conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist. And I discovered that uh, until 1967, conspiracy theory uh, had been used you know, now and then, and in no consistent way. The phrase conspiracy theorist never, 
Nobody ever called anybody a conspiracy theorist in print. So what happened in 1967? Well, 1967 was the year that the CIA sent its memo 1035-960 to all station chiefs worldwide, basically explaining that the problem they were faced with was the traction that certain conspiracy theorists were getting uh, raising questions about the Warren Report. U.S. Chief Justice Earl Warren is the bearer of the sad epilogue. The report of the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, compiled by the commission created by President Johnson, which was headed by the Chief Justice himself. What the memo told the CIA station chiefs to do was to um, contact their media assets and encourage them to uh, attack and discredit the conspiracy theorists. I mean, the memo actually uses that phrase. The conspiracy theorists in question, these are people like Mark Lane and Edward J. Epstein and others who, who have written books, raising perfectly rational questions about the Warren Report. The memo recommended, for example, arguing that a conspiracy of this magnitude could not have been kept secret. Okay which is an argument we still hear today about things like 9-11. Uh, you suggest to the editors or reporters you talk to that um, the conspiracy theorists um, use some material deliberately generated by communist propagandists. Okay? So the memo went out, and it's, it's no coincidence that that marks the moment when we first start to see those phrases used, uh, and used increasingly as as the decades roll by. It seems clear to me that, that uh, we're, we're moving to a kind of crisis point in the deployment of, of that phrase uh, because the authorities, the press, the state uh, now use the phrase openly and explicitly as... Um, in reference to who? Who are they labeling with that phrase? Well, anyone who raises questions about the prevailing propaganda narratives as a conspiracy theorist. They happen to be anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists. With reasons varying from general skepticism to conspiracy theories. A new wave of conspiracy theories that have been shared through social media. And COVID-19 is acting as an accelerant to conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories voted definitely true by dipshit Uncle Quarterly. Evil theories about you know, did we create the pandemic? Are we trying to profit from it? If you go online, there's no shortage of conspiracy theories. All right, so here's one. The virus was bioengineered in a lab. These clean-cut conspiracy narratives are designed to prey on your pre-established suspicion. Let's start with the most widespread theory, that the virus escaped from a Chinese laboratory. It is very, very strongly leaning towards this could not have been artificially or deliberately manipulate. Something you probably have heard from a certain corner of the right is this theory that the coronavirus, quote, escaped from the lab. The email sent to you said conspiracy theory gains momentum. And this, again, was the idea of the lab leak. So how did we get here with America's most prominent public health expert saying that the lab leak theory, which was previously hawked by conspiracy theorists, might actually be credible? Questioning propaganda narratives necessarily means taking conspiracy theory seriously. When someone calls you a conspiracy theorist, they have already lost the argument because that epithet is a way to prevent discussion from taking place. And a lot of these fact checks, you know, and that kind of thing that, that, that are now, dare I say, pandemic, you know, you do a search on practically anything that's controversial and what Google will give you first is page after page of, of denials and rebuttals and fact checks and all that kind of stuff, right? You have to go way, way, way down to find the actual story itself that's being called a hoax, right? Well, that's because in defending the propaganda narrative, they don't have an argument. They don't have a defense. They have none. They have none. So they basically fill, try to fill people's minds with derisive portrayals of the people, uh, you know, raising the question. It seems to me that uh, the year 2020 and then uh, the first half of 
2021 have comprised um, a, a global propaganda spectacle uh, of unprecedented scale and sophistication. Let's go back and um, let's do a kind of review of uh, last year uh, up through J January 6th of this year and uh, with a thought as to what, be, what might be coming next, right? Uh, let's go through all that as, as we would do it in a propaganda course, okay? Now let's try to cast our minds back to 2019, okay? You might say 1 BC, okay? <laughs> 1 before COVID. It's worth noting that uh, 2019 was characterized at the end of the year in a pretty perceptive article uh, in Extra, which is the magazine of fairness and accuracy in reporting, noting that 2019 would go down in history as the year of the protest. If the authorities were hoping that this protest movement would fizzle over time, they were terribly wrong. Even pouring rain hasn't dampened the protesters' enthusiasm. They made the point that the overfocus on Hong Kong throughout the Western media tended to obscure the fact that the world was, you know, hit with all kinds of organic, spontaneous protest movements that year. The point of the article was that they shouldn't have focused only on Hong Kong, right? But they should have taken note of uh, feminist protests all over South and Central America, uh, a long protest movement that racked Honduras, you know, over a stolen election, the Yellow Vests in France, the Bernie movement in the United States, a major protest movement in Lebanon, you know, that, that the overfocus on Hong Kong was, you know, due to the fact that Western intelligence is sort of involved in all that, right? I think it's worth recalling with a sense of poignancy that there were all these organic protests in 2019 because the rollout of the virus put an end to all that very, very efficiently in exactly the same way that World War I put an end to a tremendous amount of left-wing organization and protest prior to 1914. I, for one, believe that we were subjected to a series of carefully planned psychological operations over the course of 2020 and just beyond. I think it started with the rollout of the virus, and I want to make a few observations on this. I mean, we heard vague rumors about it, you know, that, oh, there's a virus in China and so on. What happened? Well, what happened was that China and the, and the UK simultaneously rolled out these really ludicrous images made in China of people dropping dead in the streets. Nobody drops dead of COVID-19 in the streets. But, you know, nobody knew that at the time because we didn't know what COVID-19 was or supposedly was. We had no idea. So there are these creepy images of people, you know. China has identified the cause of the mysterious new virus. Coronavirus. Coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This is a rapidly emerging situation. We're, there is not a cause for alarm. The first U.S. case has been detected. There's confirmation the coronavirus has reached Australia. China is urging its citizens not to travel abroad as it struggles to contain the virus. I have today declared that the coronavirus presents a public health emergency in the United States. Countries around the world have now reported more than one million coronavirus cases. This particular instance of fear-mongering is the most persuasive the most um, compelling, the most devastating kind of fear-mongering uh, you know, that's ever really been used in the history of propaganda. And that's really saying something, because propaganda drives, war propaganda drives, right? whether they actually concern war or, or just political war, uh, have always, always relied on fear and anger, right? And the first effective modern propaganda drive was uh, what the Allies did in World War I to demonize the Germans as the Hun, right? 
these stories, these horrific, nauseating stories of atrocities in Belgium, right? The rape of Belgium. They supposedly impaled babies on bayonets and cut off the breast of Red Cross nurses and crucified a Canadian. They made all these stories up, They're completely fabricated. The German army was fairly ruthless in Belgium, yes, but they did none of the things they were accused of doing. And almost no American reporters uh, told the truth. There were a group of five who went over there, distinguished investigative reporters. They came back and they, they wrote pieces saying, you know, we didn't see anything like this, this is all made up, but that stuff was lost in the tidal wave of infuriating propaganda about these brutes. The idea that propaganda, like ideology, is something that they do, the aliens do, the communists do it, you know, the totalitarians do it, that's completely false. Modern propaganda, whether political or commercial, is an Anglo-American invention, okay? The Nazis learned from it. I don't think the Bolsheviks learned from it so much. You know, their propaganda was more doctrinal you know, more solidly rooted in Marxist uh, uh, dogma. Uh, uh, but that's not the kind that has prevailed. And so what distinguishes this one from, the, you, know, the, you know, the COVID propaganda drive rollout from, say, the World War I propaganda? What makes it so much worse? Well, we, we can regard the history of fear-mongering in propaganda as a, as a process of making the enemy ever uh, more inchoate and pervasive, okay? I mean, the Germans, there they are on the battlefield, right, with their helmets and all that stuff. That's a nation uh, at war, okay? That sort of gives way uh, a few decades later to the specter of uh, communism, Right? So, so the enemy becomes Soviet communism, which is already more demonic than the Hun, because anybody you know, your mailman could be a communist. You know? This is the kind of thing that Hoover... Right, he compared it to an epidemic, didn't he? He did. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life. It reveals a condition akin to disease that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. We've almost gotten right down to the metaphor itself, That's haven't right. we? That's exactly right. The one we all know is the specter of uh, terrorism, right? 9-11 mm -hmm. now conceives the enemy as almost as an abstraction. You know, it's, it's, it's terrorism, a war on terrorism, a war on terror. It's an abstract noun. Right, it's an abstract noun. It makes no sense. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. But it was very important to you know, denationalize the enemy you know, by claiming, well, yeah, we'll bomb Afghanistan, although they didn't attack us, because they're harboring, you know, and this is you know, a mental image that calls up of this sort of vast, teeming, swarthy mass of terrorists, you know, who are, who are actually concealing their Islamist uh, extremism and so on. And there's an idea that this could be infectious it's too. It's catchy, yeah. It's catchy, it's catching in the prisons and so on, right? And indeed, you know, starting in 2014, we have various world leaders uh, comparing conspiracy theory to the spread of this kind of evil ideology. David Cameron, you know, basically says that, that conspiracy theory is a way for jihadists to be lured into this very destructive machine that will blow things up, you know, at a moment's notice. It radicalizes people. Radicalizes people. We know this worldview, the peddling of lies, that 9-11 was somehow a Jewish plot, or that the 7-7 London attacks were staged. And then the following year, Francois Hollande in France, addressing an, an audience of Holocaust survivors, says that conspiracy theory is, is you know, something that, that infects people with violent anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism. It has changed its face, but it has not lost its roots of thousands of years. Some of its methods have, sadly, not changed since the beginning of time. It's still conspiracy, suspicion, falsification. So we've seen the, 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 the fear propaganda uh, move from the Hun to 
communism to terrorism, but now it makes the crucial move to the thing itself, the thing uh, with which previous uh, uh, enemies have been compared, right, in a way that makes them seem ripe for extermination, right? Uh, and that is the virus. That started in China and is now spreading throughout the world. Today, the World Health Organization officially announced that this is a global pandemic. We have been in frequent contact with our allies, and we are marshalling the full power of the federal government and the private sector to protect the American people. This is the most aggressive and comprehensive effort to confront a foreign virus in modern history. That is something that could be on any surface. That is something that could be adhering to the fingers of any loved one. That's something that's coming out of the lungs of our fellow citizens. People passing us on the street could infect us with this so that we die in agony, like those people who died of the Spanish flu, right? That's the fantasy. It is complete fantasy. So you may not even know that you're infected and be completely asymptomatic and then spread it to somebody else. I think that's been the scariest part of this uh, whole pandemic. I mean, there is no uh, asymptomatic transmission of the virus. We don't even know what the virus is. It's never been isolated, right? It disappears in the open air and the sunlight. I mean, this is complete, this is voodoo. I mean, this is primitive thinking. But How do we know there's no asymptomatic transmission? It, 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 this has been well established since a major Chinese study came out last year. There are all these stories of alleged super spreader events, and when you dig into every one of them, there wasn't any such thing. It's a fantasy, okay? The place where the virus did arguably spread was in those nursing homes where uh, either Democratic governors or other politicians in Britain, Canada, and Sweden housed COVID patients with very weakened uh, old people who were susceptible to some kind of viral infection. I say that you know, in a tentative way, but what I'm saying is that this is a completely irrational fear. It is a kind of primordial fear. That the reason why the people you and I know who have understood every previous charade have fallen for this one is because they're panicked, right? I'm gonna be honest, I felt this way for about a month and a half myself, you know? I mean, I, I, I was 70, I had Lyme disease, so I was creeping around in a mask and washing my hands, and you know, then, then you start, you get your bearings, and you um, start thinking, and you look at the evidence around you, you walk past a hospital here in New York City, and you don't see, you know, uh, bring out your dead, and all that stuff that you're reading in the New York Times. We had to get a refrigerated truck to store the bodies of patients who are dying. We are right now scrambling to try to get a few additional ventilators or even CPAP machines. If we could get CPAP machines, we could free up ventilators for patients who need them. Why is there such a demand on ventilators? And where did this come from? It's a respiratory illness for a large number of people. So uh, they all need ventilators. I'm one who, is, who believes that China was uh, in, you know, cahoots with the West uh, on this whole thing all along. And I bolster that by also noting that it was China that developed the ventilator policy that the World Health Organization then recommended to the whole world, right? And those ventilators uh, killed, I'd say, nine out of 10 of the elderly people who were hooked up to them. Yeah, right? just barotrauma, just totally blew out their lungs. Blew out their lungs, and it was that young doctor, Cameron Kyle Seidel, uh, in Brooklyn at Maimonides Medical Center who noticed that putting people, uh, you know, intubating them was just a way to kill them because they had, uh, you know, low oxygen levels in their blood. It was more like high altitude sickness. And as we know from the travel nurse, Erin uh, Marie Olszewski, uh, who, you know, went undercover at Elmhurst uh, Hospital, as I don't have to tell you, uh, they, they seem to be playing this macabre game of musical bids, you know just basically doing things to people that would be sure to kill them. Like the guy over oh, in... I had two 20 yeah. that were two negatives. And they're, they end up positive. Like the guy over in 29, I had him upstairs because I was on CCU before it. Yeah. And he came in with a, a, with a stroke. I know, that's what 26 one was, a stroke. It's and no COVID. And no, he's got COVID and he's on a vent. Well, because we gave it to him here. 
My bigger problem with this whole scenario is when they intubate people who don't need it. Yeah. And it looks very clear to me that they're just pushing it. It was like the day before intubation, he was fine on the yeah. rebreather. And then they intubated, and then he got a new mole, and then they put in a cap too, and then it's a shit. And now he's 37 years old and dead. That's what I'm seeing. Like all these negative tests, <laughs> and they're and they're putting them on these vents. It, hopeful that they'll get it. They're being put on these COVID floor. It's murder. It, it straight up is. It is setting these people up for failure based on money. Who's paying this bonus of twenty nine thousand? I, I believe it's medic Medicaid Medicare. Hmm. It's government money. But I don't know exactly where it's coming from, but I know that it is. But I know the orders are coming from uh, the above, someone above. And everybody says that it's someone higher up. I'm not. I'm not suggesting in any way that I think that uh, you know COVID-19 was a hoax, and there are people who think that. But it's it's worth noting that 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 characterization of what I'm arguing is a very handy way to discredit what I'm saying. Oh, you think it was a hoax? Well, no, I don't think it was a hoax, in as much as there was clearly some kind of illness with fairly unique symptoms that did, uh, you know, really, really hit certain populations in certain places and in certain hospitals very hard. That's true. Um, but that doesn't mean that the magnification of the danger wasn't, in effect, a hoax. That doesn't mean that using this as a pretext for lockdown wasn't a hoax. There it was never a single moment when this whole crisis was the subject of appropriate democratic procedures, not once. They never had hearings with people on all sides. You know, they never listened to anybody but Dr. Fauci, right? Well, when people are, are terrorized uh, and there's a so-called state of emergency, you know, uh, democracy is put on hold. I mean, this is something that the framers understood, right? The reason why they broke up presidential power and, and you know, uh, separated powers as they did was to make it much harder for uh, the president to behave like a king and uh, use war as a way to tax the peasants and have them, you know, uh, uh, join the military and so on. Or they, take on tyrannical powers generally. Exactly. They were acutely conscious of the possibility of the executive turning into a tyrannical force, right? Well, it works every time. We've all heard, you know, various people quoting Hermann Goering's famous utterance during the Nuremberg trials, when uh, you know he was interviewed by uh, this army psychiatrist uh, and told him that it's a very easy matter to get people to do what you want, you know, uh, just convince them they're under attack, and that anyone who argues with that claim uh, is putting them at risk. The psychiatrist and a good American objected that that wouldn't happen in the United States because we are a democratic republic, blah, blah, blah. And Goering, with a kind of weary cynicism, waved that away and said, it doesn't matter what kind of government you have. It could be communist, it could be fascist, it could be democratic. You just convince people they're under attack and you can do whatever you want, okay? So again, the, the evocation of the virus is all around us, you know, it was enough to turn the wits of millions of highly educated people, you know, got them doing the most perverse things that they're doing even now, you know, masking their children, right? These are people who don't seem to do any study whatsoever. If they did, they'd know that children have strong natural immunity to COVID-19. They don't get it and they don't transmit it. They would also know that masks don't work. They would also know that masks make you sicker, that they weaken your immune system, that they dull the wits through hypoxia. They would know this, but they don't, because all they do, all they, all they read, all they watch is their favorite media outlets, which are all saying the same thing. It's as if people have been under hypnosis by the media, and it's based, again, on panic. It's based on fear. If you're sufficiently terrorized by the images, and it is the images, and it is the words, right? And the numbers on the screen. The numbers on the screen, you know, it's constant, it's unremitting, it's one-sided. 
Those are all characteristics of a successful propaganda drive. They're the same characteristics that the Nazis used in their propaganda drives, and the German people, too, were under hypnosis, right? And at that, I mean, a lot of them, especially the uneducated ones, didn't even really become anti-Semitic, you know? But they just kind of gave in because they were surrounded by peer pressure and physical threats and stuff like that. That, you know, I used to think it was tasteless to compare our system and our lives and our society in any way with the Nazis. I no longer think that. I now understand perfectly how that happened because the same thing is happening here, right? People have been so terrorized by the plague of COVID-19 that they are, have been desperate for those injections. 